Japanese politics is also a very important uh, situation, a very important context in which all of this takes place. And uh, there is nobody better than uh, Professor Jerry Curtis, uh, who is the Burgess Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Columbia University and the former director of Columbia's Weatherhead East Asia Institute and a distinguished research fellow at the Tokyo Foundation to address us today. He has spent uh, more than 47 years um, both in that role at Columbia University and uh, re visiting and living in Japan and uh, really getting into the thick of Japanese politics to the point where he is second to none in his understanding of um, Japanese politics as a foreigner. Um, and uh, it's a delight to uh, be able to welcome here to him here today. When I was ambassador in Japan, uh, it was a great opportunity always to uh, speak to Jerry when I had the opportunity and he had the time. Um, and uh, he was a, a great um, counsel uh, of benefit to me and I'm sure he will be to all, everybody here today. So I welcome him here uh, to speak and uh, ask you to come to the stage. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm truly delighted uh, to be able to be here today and be part of this um, Japan update uh, uh, day. Um, um, I'm looking forward to the panel discussions after I get finished here and uh, to learning from others about your perspectives on Japan. And I, I, I already have learned a lot just by listening uh, to Jason um, uh, right now. Um, I want to thank uh, Ambassador McLean for his very generous introduction. I hadn't, we met last night, first time since uh, uh, he had uh, been ambassador in Japan and uh, delight to see him again. Also delight to see the Japanese ambassador here in Australia who's uh, with us this morning and, uh, and Mrs. Kusaka because we know each other from their previous uh, position which was as the ambassador and consul general in New York City. So. I had to come all the way down uh, to Canberra to catch up uh, with uh, Kusaka-san, but I'm delighted to have had the, to have the chance to do so. So, uh, you know, these panels this afternoon are going to go over the politics, foreign policy, um, uh, womenomics, and other issues. Uh, so I think maybe I thought that what I might uh, usefully contribute this morning would be to provide some background and perspective by focusing my comments on the structural changes that have been ongoing in the Japanese political system and in the international political system and how they're changing uh, the policy process and changing uh, policy itself. Now, some of you who know me are aware that I've been involved in the study of Japanese politics for a very long time. I first lived in Tokyo in 1964 the year of the Tokyo Olympics. And I'm still studying Japanese politics as the next Tokyo Olympics approaches 56 years after the last one. So the question some of you may have in mind is, why? <laughs> what is it that has been so interesting about Japan and its politics that has kept my attention for more than half a century, as it has. Well, you know, at first sight, it doesn't appear that very much about Japanese politics has changed over this time. The LDP was dominant, ruled alone for nearly 40 years after it was created in 1955. It suffered a hiccup in 1996 when it lost power for several months to a ragtag coalition under Prime Minister Hosokawa. Uh, that included every other party in the Diet except for the Communists. And then it suffered a more serious uh, defeat in 2009 when the Democrats came to power, the DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan. They lasted in power for three years, during which time the DPJ's main accomplishment was to convince the public of its incompetence in running a government. 
So the LDP came back to power, and it is now stronger, and the opposition is weaker than ever before. The LDP has a large majority of lower house seats. Two-thirds with its accommodating coalition partner, the Komeito. And as a result of the upper house election that was held this uh, past July, now the ruling party of the LDP has a single party majority in that chamber too, for the first time in 27 years. Two thirds of the seats in the upper house uh, are held by pay parties that favor constitutional revision. <coughs> Prime Minister Abe will have been in office for six years when his term ends in 2018. It looks likely, uh, very likely in my view, that the LDP will amend its party rules to allow him to run for a third term. And if he gets another term, he will have been in office longer than any prime minister in modern Japanese history, not just post-war. Beating out the three longest previous prime ministers uh, to pre-war, Katsura, Katsura Taro, Ito Hirobumi, and then Sato Eisaku in the post-war period. All of them elected from the same prefecture, Yamaguchi Prefecture, before the, uh, in the major period, the area known as Choshu, as Prime Minister Abe uh, himself. Right now, there's nobody in sight who looks as though he or she might become strong enough to defeat Abe should he decide to run. But a lot can happen in the next two years. If the economy worsens, if Renho, the new leader of the Democratic Party, surprises, surprises the skeptics and offers an appealing alternative, and if dissatisfaction with Abe grows strong within the LDP, well, then the situation may change quite dramatically. It's unlikely, but nowhere as unlikely as the idea that Donald Trump would become the Republican <laughs> candidate for president and indeed might well become the next president of the United States. Something I'm actually gonna come back to and talk about briefly at the end of this presentation. Because you cannot give a talk about anything today without getting into this crazy situation that exists in American politics, which has a big impact, by the way, on the US-Japan relationship. <clears throat> As so, we come to the opposition parties, uh, as I just said, so the LDP, yeah, a lot of, you know, what's what, so what's changed? The LDP was the dominant power before it's the dominant power now. As for the opposition parties, they are what they've always have been in post-war Japan, except for those two brief and unsuccessful experiences in government. They're parties whose function is to oppose, to reject LDP policy, especially in a knee-jerk fashion when it comes to national security policy and to do so without any expectation that doing this is going to bring them to power. <clears throat> so, since the LDP favors constitutional reinterpretation to permit collective defense, so the Democratic Party opposes it, even though many of its leaders actually support it. When he was Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Noda Yoshiko, the, the DPJ uh, Prime Minister, talked in the Diet raising the diet the possibility of reinterpreting the Constitution to permit collective uh, uh, defense. And his government actually drafted the bill that eventually became the classified uh, secrets, uh, secrets law. But the head of the, of, the deep, of the Democratic Party at the time of the upper house election this past July, Mr. Okada, he tried to turn the election into a referendum uh, on Article 9. Uh, opposition to revision of Article 9. But Prime Minister Abe downplayed that issue, <clears throat> focused his appeal on Abenomics, claiming that Japan was halfway home, halfway towards the goal line, and asking the public to give the party the support he needed to make Abenomics a success. And the Democrats don't have an economic strategy to offer in place of Abenomics. So they could do little better than criticize Abe for not achieving his goal, which he had already conceded. So no wonder support for the Democratic Party is in the single digits. And we'll see whether Renho is able to 
change that situation. Now the voters. So here too, at first glance, not much seems to have changed. The strong pacifist or isolationist sentiment in the public is not shared by the LDP leadership, and it never has been shared by the LDP leadership. But that has not stopped voters from giving the LDP diet majorities. This is a particular and a peculiar feature of Japanese politics. They did so when Kishi Nobusuke was prime minister in the late 1950s, and they do so now with his grand grandson, Abe Shinzo, holding that post. So the reasons why the LDP is able to win, even though there's considerable public um, uh, criticism of some of its key policies, are much the same now as they were in the past. It wins by default. It wins because voters want stability, and they don't believe the opposition parties can govern effectively. Public opinion polls show majorities oppose constitutional revision. Majorities oppose collective defense of the classified secrets legislation. And interesting, the majority of Japanese voters, when you ask them, do not believe that they've benefited from Abenomics. But the LDP wins because voters assume that things would not be better were the LDP to be replaced as the governing party, and probably they'd be worse, both in terms of the economy and its relations with the United States. So this is not a new story. But there's a new story, and it's an important story about how Japan's political democracy has evolved and is evolving. How the parties, the LDP, the Komeito, uh, the Democrats, how their organization has changed, and how the relationship between the ruling party and the government has changed. And those are the issues I want to spend a few minutes um, talking about before looking at some issues of foreign policy. So for those of you who are students uh, of Japanese politics and read about the history of uh, the, uh, the LDP as being a coalition of factions, it's no longer a coalition of factions. Factions are not that important, not, not what they once were. And it doesn't any longer operate as something that I once referred to as the party's franchise system, in which candidates essentially self-select, get factional backing, use that to obtain the party's endorsement and to amass a political war chest, and run a campaign built almost entirely on the candidate's personal organization and name recognition and appeal. Partly due to changes in the electoral system, but not only for that reason, the, the prime minister, the president of the, of the party who's prime minister, and a few other key party leaders, they determine candidate endorsements. They control the funds that now go to support uh, campaigns. So, you know, in any country, a candidate's personal appeal, uh, his organizational muscle matter, but in Japan, they matter, but they are not anywhere as important as they used to be. It is a very big change. National diet election outcomes are much more influenced these days by the appeal of the party leader and by the public perceptions of the ruling party's competence in dealing with national and international issues than was true in the past. Now, during the sort of golden years of LDP rule, there were two main recruiting grounds for LDP diet candidates. Local politicians, especially prefectural assemblymen uh, who moved up the ranks and ran for the diet, and retired high-ranking bureaucrats. Today, there's still a lot of bureaucrats going into politics in Japan. But they go in after just a few years in the bureaucracy, having made an early choice to have a political rather than a bureaucratic career. They may be policy wonks, but they don't have the experience or the personal connections inside the bureaucracy that made it possible for leaders like Ikeda or Ohira or Fukuda or Miyazawa 
who rose to the highest posts in the bureaucracy to be effective um, uh, political uh, leaders. And as for local politicians, there are very few who graduate to the diet any longer. The term for the group of political professionals and the diet, to jinha, has almost completely disappeared from the, Japan, from the Japanese political vocabulary, as have the politicians who used to make Japanese politics so, um, uh, uh, so, so colorful. Uh, there are many talented and terrific uh, people in the, in the diet, in the LDP, uh, but there are too many diet politicians in my view who try too hard to prove to the public that they know more about policy than the bureaucrats do and do not put enough energy into doing what politicians need to do, work hard at constituency service and explain complex issues in terms most people can understand. This was particularly true of the DPJ, uh, which came to power saying that from now on politicians rather than bureaucrats are going to be making the decisions. In Japanese, seiji shido. Excluding bureaucrats rather than mobilizing their expertise, a major reason for the DPJ's um, um, failure to rule effectively. <clears throat> Japan, as I mentioned, changed the electoral system in 1993 from this multi-member district where uh, where multiple candidates were elected to essentially a single member district with a proportional representation piece to it. But it's predominantly a single member district system. In the Japanese social context, this has been very detrimental, in my view, to the quality of Japanese politics. It's played an important role in the disappearance of interesting and impressive politicians. Factions and the accompanying corruption were weakening under the old system. It wasn't necessary to have electoral change to bring it about. Public concern about national and not just constituency issues was increasing before the system was changed. The Japanese electorate has become more diverse and that made it much more difficult to run LDP to run multiple candidates in many districts and win. So, in my view and in the view of a lot of politicians at the time, and especially now, uh, if that system had been kept in place, Japan probably would have evolved a, a moderately <coughs> pluralistic party system. But the idea that all the evils of Japanese, all the problems in Japanese politics, um, or many of them could be resolved by adopting this new electoral system was picked up by the media and it overwhelmed um, the opposition and it was passed. And it's, Japan will live with this electoral system for a long time to come because you cannot get fundamental electoral change um, uh, very often. Um, but I think what has happened is that as a result of this system change, Japan has got a system now that weakens the links between politicians and their constituents, weakens grassroots democracy, concentrates too much power in the party executive. And rather than consolidating a two-party system, which was its supposedly its goal, it may be creating a more uncontested one-party dominant system than was true before, which is a point, major point I guess I make in the, in the article that is in this uh, current issue of, um, of the East Asia Forum. Uh, <clears throat> This may be getting down into a little bit too much into the weeds for some of you, but I think that uh, another important and overlooked factor in how a, why political organization on the local level has, been, has changed as much as it has in Japan has not been the electoral system, but the amalgamation of towns and villages. There was a major amalgamation of, uh, uh, in the Meiji period that reduced the number of municipalities from over 71,000 that existed in 1883 to um, so a little more than 14,000, 71,000 to 14,000 by the turn of the century. And then after the Second World War, there was another um, uh, amalgamation wave that brought the number of municipalities 
down to about 3,500 by 1960. But in the first decade uh, of the 21st century, the government initiated an uh, even more ambitious amalgamation program, reduced the number of municipalities, um, and with that, the number of village, town, and city assemblies to 1,719, 1,719. 53% fewer than had existed at the end of the 20th century. So the, pur what's the purpose of this amalgamation, this reduction in the number of municipalities, was to reduce costs and make government more efficient. But political reform almost always has unintended consequences. And this one had an unintended consequence. It undermined the ability of the LDP's political machine which is the sum total of the personal political machines of Islam members to deliver the vote. So as the number, the point is this, as the number of municipalities has gotten smaller, the number of votes a local assembly means, needs to get elected has gotten larger, has increased. In my old book about election campaigning in Japan, Daish no Tanjo in Japanese, I talk a lot about the key role local politicians played in gathering the vote for diet members. But local politicians no longer can rely as much on the face-to-face -face relationships they enjoyed with their supporters in very small, cohesive communities to obtain the votes they need to get elected and the votes that they can deliver, deliver to the diet candidate that they are supporting. And this was brought home to the LDP in 2009 when it lost the election to the DPJ. Uh, the machine doesn't deliver, and it's, causing the, it's caused the LDP to change in many ways the way it goes about trying to raise, uh, uh, to get votes. And voters in Japan are much less susceptible to appeals that they vote out of a sense of obligation or in accord with community consensus that they were before. Whenever I talk about this, I, the memory that comes back to me goes back all those many years ago um, when I was doing the research for this book on election campaigning. I was in some rural mountain village with a local assemblyman, and we're walking down the street uh, in, this, in this village, and a farmer approaches from the other direction. And this assemblyman I'm with says to him, you know, there's an election for the diet coming soon, and I'm supporting this candidate name was Sato. I'm supporting Sato. I hope you will too. And their response was very um, striking. He said, of course, I am so indebted to you, of course I'll vote for Sato. This was Japan. Not Japan today. Can you imagine the United States, I think here in Australia as well, and you walk down the street and, and, uh, it, you know, in some, some uh, community in, 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 in the States, and uh, a local politician meets a friend and says, I'm supporting uh, uh, Joe Smith, and uh, I wish you would too. He says, of course, I, you know, I owe you so many favors, I'll vote, I'll vote for, for Mr. Smith. No, you don't. This, this was Japan. This is not Japan uh, anymore. It's a big change. Um, so the result is that the LDP machine still functions, but it's a very weak shadow of once it once was. Local politicians are no longer the central players in the LDP's election campaigns. In the old days, Diet members provided what the Japanese referred to as a pipe, a pipe to the central government's coffers. But much less money flows through these pipelines now, and voters demand for yet more bridges, more highways, more dams has dramatically decreased. Uh, I think it was the, the first time that I had a conversation with uh, Abe Shinzo, the current prime minister, was when he had been elected, I think only if, 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 after his first term in office. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly why, but I called on him in, in his office and we chatted. And um, uh, like a lot of politicians those days, they had read this, this book of mine, which uh, Never sold much in the United States, but it was, became quite well known in Japan. It's very important to get a good title when you publish a book. I, you know, in English, it was election campaigning Japanese style. Excuse me while I yawn. Uh, but 
uh, in Japanese, Daigishi no Tanjo, my, my editor had a, had a great knack of picking a good title. Anyway, uh, Abe said, you know, I read your book when I was younger and uh, 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 I, was, I, you know, I was, it was very interesting, but said even in my prefecture in Yamaguchi, you could not win election, win an election today running the kind of campaign you described there because my voters are not interested in yet another highway, yet another bridge, yet another, a, a, another pork barrel project. They want, they're interested in their social security benefits. They're interested in, in pollution control. They're interested in their children's future. It's a different agenda. And this was in the mid 1990s and it's become even more so uh, today. Now, the LDP is not the only party to change. I want to talk a little bit about the Komeito, uh, because it's a very interesting story of social change in Japan, I think. The Komeito, which is the LDP's coalition partner, has gone through a quite dramatic transformation. Uh, from the late 1960s, for about a decade, I was um, the director of a US-Japan parliamentary exchange <coughs> program, and I would regularly bring American uh, uh, congressmen uh, to Tokyo to meet their Japanese counterparts. The first conference we had in Tokyo was in 1969. And we arranged for the US delegation to have separate meetings with the leaders of each of the political parties, um, including the Komeito. But that party had only been formed five years earlier as the political arm of Sokogakkai. And its support was concentrated among poor people who had migrated from the countryside to the cities. Uh, many of them worked at unskilled jobs without job security. And the party advocated policies that positioned it on the Japanese left, where it competed most especially with the communists. But to the American congressman and to me, it appeared to be much more a party of the right than of the left, and disturbingly so. We met with the Komeito Diet members at the Sokogakkai headquarters in Shinanomachi. And it began with our being taken to an auditorium to see a film about Sokogakkai. And the movie looked as though it had been produced in North Korea. <laughs> the same adulation for their leader, Ikeda Daisaku, as the North Koreans showered on Kim Il-sung the same mass gatherings where people in the stands uh, uh, would lift colored cards in perfect uh, synchronization uh, to spell out the party's propaganda slogans. Several of the American participants left that movie and left the meeting shaken by the experience. This was the Komeito in 1970. But the Komeito has traveled a huge distance since then. Sokogakkai eventually broke its ties with Nichiren Shoshu uh, and gave up the practice of shakfuku. Shakfuku is kind of an intense brainwashing effort to get people to convert to Sokogakkai. And over time, the Komito moved to the center of the political spectrum, first on the center left, and then after 1998, on the center right as the LDP's coalition partner. Seven decades after the end of the war, Sokogakkai members are no longer impoverished and frightened migrants from rural Japan who came to Sokogakkai through Shakfuku. Sokogakkai members today are for the most part people who grew up in Sokogakkai households, households that, it, it, that enjoy a degree of affluence that early generations of Gakkai members could not imagine. They are people born into the religion, not converted to it. <clears throat> so many of their parents, kind of the first generation Sokogakkai members, many of their parents, like Japanese parents generally, knowing that the path to success is through the higher education system, push their children to get a good education. As a result, Sokogakkai members now hold important positions in the government bureaucracy and in business and in other professions. The Komeito, in other words, 
has become the political arm of a religious organization with deep roots in the middle class. And it's that change in the social composition of the Gakkai membership that makes it possible to have alliance with the LDP. And it's why when American politicians now meet with Komeito leaders, those leaders never mention Sokogakai, almost never mention Sokogakai, and for certain, they don't bring him to Sokogakai headquarters in Shiranomachi anymore. It's a big and interesting change, at least in my view. Now, as for the leading opposition party, the Democrats, it's torn, torn between a pragmatic wing that favors it becoming a kind of second conservative party, more liberal than the LDP on economic and social issues, and supportive of a bipartisan foreign policy. And another wing that clings to a traditional pacifist position and is more to the left on domestic issues. There's a lot of skepticism in the Democratic Party and outside that Renho will be able to unify this party. But at least, so far so good. She reached out to the conservative wing of the party by getting former Prime Minister Noda, who I mentioned earlier, to agree to be the party's Secretary General. Perhaps she'll surprise uh, everyone. Um, in any case, the LDP is not as popular as it might appear. Um, voting rates have gone down. They they, they, they've been, they, they do well, but it's not as popular as it might appear, so that even if the Democratic Party does not get strong enough to challenge its hold on power, it's quite possible that it can win enough seats to act as a break and to provoke leadership change in the LDP. But <clears throat> the point to be stressed is that the fundamental weakness of Japan's political democracy continues to be the failure of political forces opposed to the LDP to create a party that offers the voters a realistic alternative. The Democrats had their shot in 2009, and they blew it. They were unprepared. They lacked government experience. Instead of trying to mobilize the bureaucracy and leveraging its expertise, they turned it into its enemy by excluding it from important policy making. Uh, decisions. So, under uh, uh, current circumstances, the only way the opposition is going to succeed is if uh, the LDP loses public confidence and splits. It's happened before, but there's no reason to believe it's going to happen again anytime soon. So, I've gone on some length here about these internal party changes to make a simple point. The LDP is, in important respects, a different party today from what it used to be. It employs, it employs a different strategy to obtain voter support. There's continuity, to be sure, but the changes are more dramatic, not only in the LDP, but in the political system overall. So the kind of dynamic tension that used to characterize relations among LDP factions and between the LDP and the opposition, that's given way to a new kind of dominance by the LDP, and to incoherence in the policy goals and strategies of the opposition. Uh, there's also been a basic change in the relationship between the ruling party and the government. And this is a very critical, a very crucial, um, of a very crucial importance for the way policy is made. Political power today is concentrated in the prime minister's office to a degree that has never been true in Japanese history. The cabinet is no longer a group of equals, each minister in effect being the CEO uh, of his ministry and the prime minister serving as a kind of chairman of the board. This is Abe Shinzo's cabinet. He demands loyalty, he gets it, he's kept people and whom he trusts and whom he needs to maintain control over the party in the cabinet in key positions for
for an unprecedentedly long time. The Chief Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Suga, the Finance Minister, Mr. Aso, the Foreign Minister, Mr. Kishida, have been in those positions since Abe came into, uh, uh, into office this time. <coughs> Mr. Shiozaki, the Health and Welfare Minister from the first Cabinet reshuffle. The party's role in policymaking has been sharply reduced as power has become concentrated in the Prime Minister's office. Not only that, but the Prime Minister's office, the Kante in Japanese, the Kante controls high bureaucratic appointments in a more hands-on fashion than ever before. There was a reform in 2012 that created a new personnel affairs bureau in the Prime Minister's office. It gives the Chief Cabinet Secretary control, ability to, uh, to uh, the power to vet around 600 <coughs> top appointments. This creates really strong incentives for bureaucrats hoping for promotion not to question the Prime Minister's policy positions. It was Prime Minister Hashimoto in the 19, nine, late 1990s who initiated the administrative reforms that have created this Kante-centered political process. He reduced the number of ministries, created the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy uh, that enables the prime ministers to set policy priorities and impose them on the bureaucracy. I didn't appreciate Hashimoto all that much when he was alive. Um, he was a rather prickly, difficult uh, personality, uh, hard to get to know, at least for me. Uh, but I think, um, I kind of owe this to him, I think uh, historians will view him as one of the more important uh, post-war uh, Japanese uh, uh, prime ministers. And his reforms were further advanced by Koizumi, who ended the practice of uh, having the executive council of the LDP have to approve government legislation before submitting it to the Diet. And he made the, the uh, uh, Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy a truly important institution. But Kante leadership has become even stronger under Abe. He has greater control over the policy process than any previous prime minister. This emergence of a Kante-centered uh, policy-making system brings with it greater coherence to the policy process and greater accountability. The old system, with its powerful factions, and its complex power game between the government and the LDP, it was much more interesting. I'm glad I was around for all those years of LDP dominance and could enjoy watching this game being, being played. But it was interesting in much the same way that the operations of Tammany Hall in the town I grew up in, in Brooklyn, New York, <coughs> was interesting, or the Daily Machine in Chicago, uh, or the politics in the democratic one-party uh, southern states uh, before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. It was interesting in the way that those, those uh, politics were interesting. But it would be anachronistic if that system continued in Japan today. So these changes, I think, represent the modernization, the, the, uh, 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 the evolution, uh, in a very positive sense, of of, of, Japanese, of Japanese politics. But the concentration of power in the prime minister's office brings with it its own dangers, especially when you have such a weak political opposition. Having an opposition, having opposition parties that were a permanent opposition was perhaps not so problematic when the LDP itself operated like a coalition of party-like factions when individual cabinet ministers didn't hesitate to make policy pronouncements without clearing them with the prime minister's office. And when new LDP candidates running in these multi-member districts took policy positions critical of the government. There was more of a turnover between incumbent and new diet members under the old system than under the current system. But a lot of the turnover happened within the LDP, so in a, you know, there were three LDP incumbents running in a five-member district. One or two of them, might, one of them might be defeated by a new LDP candidate who is arguing against the party's position. That doesn't happen, uh, happen now. But of course, now that the prime minister's power over the cabinet 
and over the party is so strong. The question that arises in Japan is where are the checks and balances necessary for a democratic polity going to come from? And this question has taken on a new urgency since it's not only the opposition parties that have become less vigorous, but the liberal media as well. The Asei Shimbun in particular having lost much of its influence in shaping public opinion. So the question then that comes up is this. Given the power that I've described here that the prime minister exercises over the party and the two-thirds majority that his party has um, uh, in the lower house and with the Komeito in the upper house as well, the question arises, why hasn't Abe done more to push through major reforms, to push through the so-called third arrow structural reforms? No doubt, the economy is in some ways stronger now than it was when Abe came into office, as Ambassador Kusaka was explaining to us, to a few of us last evening uh, uh, over dinner. But Abenomics has failed to achieve the goals it set for itself. Monetary policy has not achieved this 2% inflation target. The three arrows, <coughs> monetary policy, stimulative fiscal policy, uh, a growth strategy based on fundamental structural reforms. These three arrows were supposed to be bundled together. The idea, which goes back to an old Japanese fable, being that while it's easy to break one arrow, tying three arrows together makes them too strong to break. But these arrows have not been linked. They're not connected. The third arrow has not taken aim at important structural issues. And the second arrow of fiscal stimulus, it seems to me, especially the, the most recent um, um, uh, package that, the package that I'll be submitting to the Diet this fall, the, second, the fiscal stimulus is reverting the kind of old style LDP, uh, public work spending and pork barrel spending. And many observers are wondering now whether this first hour of monetary policy is close to being broken, that is, to losing its effectiveness. I think that Prime Minister Abe oversold Abenomics, creating uh, unrealistic expectations, making it seem as though he was going to undertake far more radical reforms than I believe he ever intended or that he could have hoped to accomplish. I think, you know, Prime Minister Abe has always been a critic, at least before he became Prime Minister this time, of American, of American style capitalism. And unlike Koizumi, he doesn't talk of the desirability of small government. Shisa na Seifu is an expression I have never, ever heard Prime Minister uh, Abe use. He doesn't believe in Shisa na Seifu, in a small government. He's much more comfortable with a meaty style government hand in guiding the private sector. Much more comfortable with that than the hands-off, leave it to the market approach that Koizumi and his economic minister, Takenaka Heizo, are favored. Clearly, Prime Minister Abe wants to secure his place in Japanese history as the prime minister who freed Japan from its post-war regime, who restored a sense of pride in the nation's traditions that he thinks have been lost, and who will define a lead new leadership role for Japan in world affairs. He is not driven on economic policy in the same manner. And even where he would like to make bold moves, he hesitates. Abe and the LDP, they learned um, um, from the party's surprising defeat in 2009 that hubris is dangerous. In this summer's upper house election, he stayed, he stayed away from the issue he's passionate about, constitutional revision. The LDP won that election handedly, but it wasn't really a landslide as the newspapers tended to portray it. A landslide would have had the Democrats 
do no better than they did three years ago when they won 17 seats, but they won about over 30. Less than six years ago, and in this, you know, these elections are held every three, three years for six year terms, so less than, than six years ago, but more than, they sh than, than, the, than the Democrats should have won given the party's unpopularity. And they did as well as they did because of voters who don't support the Democrats but decided to vote, uh, uh, cast a vote against the LDP. So, for those of you familiar with American politics, upper house elections in Japan are like U.S. midterm congressional elections. They offer the voters an opportunity to send a message to the party in power that they're not satisfied with its performance without dragging, throwing it out of office. Abe got the message. I think he got the message after this July election that 28 trillion yen comprehensive economic package that he announced after the election, in my view, is mostly smoke and mirrors, an attempt to convince the public and financial markets that the government is taking bold action when it's really not doing anything of the kind. But there's no evidence that the announcement effect did much good. The market reaction was negative, and the public reaction in Japan was kind of neutral. People generally are not very critical of Abe, and the public opinions reflect, you know, uh, high um, uh, support. They don't think his policies are making the economy much better, but they give him credit for trying. And they believe he is doing about as much as it is realistic to expect, um, and probably better than anyone else would do. And there's no question that the public likes that he's making himself a visible presence on the world stage, including appearing on the stage in Rio as Super Mario. So even if Abe were more committed to radical reform than I believe he is, he has to deal with a political reality. The political reality is that the public, the Japanese public, does not want to see Japan emulate America's fire at will labor market or have corporations buy up large tracts of agricultural land with no guarantee that they would keep the land for agricultural purposes or that they would not find ways to drive independent farmers who want to continue to till the land to sell. <coughs> they don't want their social security benefits to be cut and they don't want to see immigration, at least not a formal immigration policy, though many people probably increasing numbers of people, grudgingly accept the need for guest workers uh, uh, and for people to uh, work at the low end of the service industry. When it comes to immigration, the business sector, and I think uh, probably Prime Minister Abe himself, are more liberal than the public. <clears throat> Many of my economist friends uh, believe that the problem is that Abe simply has not gone far enough with structural reforms that would boost productivity, especially labor market reform. <clears throat> but whether the issue be labor market reform, immigration, agriculture, compelling companies to raise wages, bringing large numbers of women into the mainstream labor force, the ability of the government to act, of any government to act, Whatever the preferences of its leaders depends on gaining the support of a public, a public that, as I've suggested, resists very much the kinds of changes that um, uh, uh, these reforms would bring about. So I think um, that the idea that Japan can raise productivity product productivity substantially if only it had a government committed to adopting the right policies, policies mostly drawn from an American playbook, is something of an illusion. Many Americans, especially those who support Trump and who supported Bernie Sanders, themselves are demanding that this playbook be rewritten. So for years to come, seems to me, Japan will be uh, a low growth economy and a wealthy country whose challenge
will be how to manage the distribution of income in an environment characterized by growing inequality among a shrinking and aging population, and maybe most important, or surely very important, how to reform a higher education system that doesn't do enough to encourage individual initiative and innovation, and skills, including language skills, necessary to be successful in a 21st century globalized economy. Abe's clear about his priorities. <clears throat> Constitutional revision, a more robust security policy, a Japan that can't stand tall in the world. And he's realistic enough to know that public's priorities are elsewhere, so he has to be patient in pushing for the changes uh, he wants. He's an interesting, uh, interesting personality. He combines strong ideological preferences with a deep pragmatism that keeps him from pressing those preferences too hard too fast. <clears throat> Briefly on the Constitution. I think we're going to see the constitutional debate kind of shift into high gear, and I don't think we're going to see constitutional revision for many years to come, at least for some years to come. Revising Article 9 um, would eliminate the ambiguity about the legal status of the self-defense forces by saying explicitly that Japan has a military force. But if it were to be amended anytime soon, it probably would combine that with a, very, with a restrictive definition of what the force can do. It'll be years before Article 9 is revised. And the debate is likely that it's going to spawn is likely to divide the public rather than generate consensus as the role of the as to the role of the of military force as a tool in Japanese foreign policy. I'm look, I just looked at my watch, and I know if I keep on talking, I'm, I'm going to see people leaving the room. So I'm going to have to be brief. But I have to say, and maybe I have a chance later. The questions I can, I'll, I'll talk about this in the question and answer period. The, the emperor's abdication issue. I think Prime Minister Abe is dealing with this in a very cautious and appropriate manner. He does not want to make this a constitutional issue. The emperor is a symbol of the state. The emperor doesn't have the right, is not in a position to make political decisions. Abdication is a political decision. Uh, if you change the fundamental law, you're making a political decision. This has to be done not in response to the emperor's desire to abdicate, but in response to uh, other issues. But Abe wants to, needs to respond to this emperor's desire to abdicate. And I think the answer will be in the diet session held after the turn of the year, a, new, a special law passed, a one-time, a law that allows a, this emperor to abdicate. And to have some, he needs some space between the emperor's okotaba, his, his, his speech, requesting this, this indirectly requesting that this happen, and actually doing it so that it's in response not to the emperor's request, but in response to overwhelming public view that this should be allowed. <coughs> That's what is going on. I think it's a very, um, a very appropriate manner to handle this because they have to permit this to happen without op getting, opening this Pandora's box. You're going to have female emperors, and you're going to change the, the fundamental law, the, the law about it, it, it succession, and so forth and so on. Now, on foreign relations, I need to say a few, a few words about, about uh, foreign relations before I, before I stop here. There's no question, Abe wants to see Japan stand tall in the world and play a larger political role in the region and globally. Uh, in order to maintain a balance of power in East Asia, alliance with the United States over the long term is all the more essential than it has ever been. Uh, and Abe recognizes this, this very well. There has been a very interesting and a very important shift on the right about alliance with the United States in Japan. <clears throat> on the right, that is to the right, to the right of, 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 of Mr. Abe, there's always been on the, on the, on the more uh, right right an underlying anti-American attitude on the part of the hard right for whom autonomy and independence has meant independence from the US, a Japan that can take care of itself. But China has convinced even those pretty far out on the right that alliance with the US and efforts to shore up the credibility of America's commitment to Asia is essential for Japan's security and will become only more so 
in the coming years and decades. Uh, structural changes in the international system are changing Japan's national security strategy and changing the dynamics of the US-Japan relationship. With the end of bipolarity and the aftermath of America's fleeting unipolar moment, East Asia is moving toward a fluid and ill-defined multipolar system, and Japan is evolving a complex foreign policy strategy to deal with it. Post-war Japanese foreign policy did not try to shape the regional order to suit its preferences. It saw the challenge of foreign policy as being able to adjust skillfully and nimbly to the changing trends of the time created by others more powerful than Japan. But Abe, Abe's strategy is more than reactive. He's adjusting Japanese policy to deal with an increasingly assertive China in a region that is in a transition away from American hegemony to one in which the US remains the most powerful country, but no longer enjoys a position of unchallengeable military superiority. China doesn't have to match American military power to make the costs to the US of using that power very high. And that cost will continue to increase as China's military grows stronger. The failure of the US Congress to pass TPP. I hope I'm wrong, but I believe that the Congress will not pass TPP in the lame duck session. Uh, and that Hillary Clinton, who I pray will become the president, because I pray even harder, harder that Donald Trump will not. Um, <laughs> she has locked herself into a position of opposition to TPP that she cannot easily wiggle out of. So TPP is not going to happen, at least for, for some time to come. I, as I say, <coughs> I hope I'm wrong, you know, your prime minister is Make, try to make a case with Congressman he's meeting that how important TPP is. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe did so in his meeting with, uh, with Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, Obama is finally trying to squeeze Republican arms and, and persuade Republicans to, to support it, something he should have done a long time ago. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe uh, my, my pessimism will prove to be, be wrong, but <clears throat> but it's but it's it, I think it will it, it's not going to not going to happen, and supporters of TPP, seeing that they're losing the debate over the potential economic benefit to the United States, have taken to argue that its passage is of huge political geopolitical significance and importance. But I think we shouldn't exaggerate that impact. Whether this trade agreement, and that's what it is, it's a trade agreement. Whether it passes or it fails, the US commitment to Japan's defense will not change. America's military pres military's presence and commitments to Asia will not change. And unless Americans themselves convince the rest of the world that the failure to pass what most Americans and a majority of Congress believe is a bad agreement, unless we convince the rest of the world that by failing to pass this bad agreement, that this signals a more general retreat from Asia, it should not have that big a negative impact. Though, of course, you know, for, for Abe in particular, he sort of walked the extra mile to make some reforms in agriculture to get TPP through, and then the US goes and pulls the rug out from under him. He cannot be happy. But I wouldn't exaggerate the importance of the failure of yet another multilateral trade agreement, the Doha Round, TPP, and so on. In this fluid, un uncertain political environment, every country in East Asia is thinking anew about its national security. Japan is no exception, and it's taken steps to see that its strategy is relevant to the world as it is now, not as it is in, uh, been, in the, been in the past. I think if Abe were to leave office tomorrow, Japan's strategy would not fundamentally change, no matter which politician succeeded him. Um, I want to say here. Uh, so <clears throat> over the past, you know, in the post-war period, the LDP adopted a large number of self-imposed self -imposed constraints on the government security policy. 
ban on collective defense, on the export of weapons, or weapons technology, 1% ceiling on defense spending, prohibition, the acquisition of offensive weaponry, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but the Abe administration has removed or is weakening these constraints, and it is pursuing a complex strategy with at least three prongs, three important prongs. Japan is going to do more for itself. It's doing more for itself. Do more to strengthen the alliance with the United States and do more to develop security relationships with Australia and with other countries in the Asia Pacific uh, region. His policy is constrained by a public that's hesitant to incur the risks that a larger security role in regional affairs entails and that remains supportive of Japan's very special brand of pacifism. It's a pacifism that says that Japan should not use military force beyond a narrow definition of self-defense, but that the United States should use military force to protect Japanese interests. Um, given the realities of American politics, the pressure on Japan to do more to contribute to the alliance will grow stronger. Uh, the LDP has always had to tread a narrow path between American demands for greater, de greater defense efforts and public opposition, public opposition to them. But I think we will see, uh, whether it be Hillary or, or Trump, a greater pressure on Japan to do more to contribute to the, uh, to the alliance. Uh, finally, I doubt sometimes that we in America appreciate enough that the more active Japan becomes diplomatically and the more it contributes to a balance of power in East Asia, the more it's going to pursue policies it sees in its interests, whether or not the U.S. agrees with them. I don't think we're necessarily prepared for the more assertive Japan that we're likely to see. Abe's determination to strengthen relations with Russia is a especially important uh, development. In Vladivostok, he issued what I, a kind of love call to Vladimir. Um, uh, he visited with him in Sochi a few months ago. He's invited him to, Yamu, to uh, Yamaguchi, his home constituency, for a summit meeting this December. He's proposed an annual summit at Vladivostok. He signaled an interest in a mutually acceptable resolution of the Northern Islands issue, which means giving up Japan's long standing uh, position that the return of all four islands is a non-negotiable demand. All of this makes sense for Japan in my view, but it's a direct challenge to the U.S. approach, which is to employ economic sanctions to punish Russia for its Ukrainian policy and to vilify uh, Putin. So managing this relationship is going to, in some ways going to be more difficult. I'll conclude with three brief observations. First, Hillary Clinton probably will win the election though it is far from certain. If Trump wins, no one knows what he will do. It's a very worrisome possibility. If Clinton wins, her positions on many issues will be heavily influenced by positions that have been staked out by Trump and by Sanders. She will have to design a new approach to trade, one that convinces Americans that she's focused on protecting workers rather than enriching large corporations. She will press allies, including Japan, to do more, much more, both in terms of money and mission, to contribute to the alliance. And I don't think she'll look kindly on foreign policy initiatives that are not in step with US policy, Russia being the most important one at the moment in terms of US-Japan relations. Second point. I think the US and Japan need to adopt a new approach to deal with Okinawa. More than 40 years after its reversion to Japanese sovereignty, Okinawa is still largely an American military protectorate. With only 0.6% of Japan's land area, it's home to more than half of the roughly 50,000 US troops in Japan and three quarters of US military bases. These bases occupy 20% of Okinawa's land area, 40% of its arable soil. This overpresence of U.S. troops is a source of growing discontent in Okinawa, crystallized in the opposition to the building of a new base at Hinoko. 
Given the changed technology of war, U.S. strategy is moving toward creating a geograph geographically dispersed military presence in East Asia. This excessive concentration in Okinawa makes those bases increasingly vulnerable to disabling missile attacks for both political and strategic reasons. The U.S. and Japan need to adopt a new policy to radically reduce the U.S. footprint in Okinawa. The third point, final point. Where Japan goes in its national security policy depends above all else on Chinese actions and on the direction of the U.S.-China relations. Japan will do what it has to do to defend itself against China. The question, how do you do that without feeding the Chinese perception that the U.S. and Japan are pursuing a containment policy? How do you avoid the security dilemma escalation of, uh, of, of tensions and uh, arms race? How do we pursue parallel, mutually supportive, and constructive policies, that is the U.S. and Japan, towards China? That's the major challenge to the alliance in the many years to come. Thank you.